welcome along um, and good morning. Uh, my name is Chris Warwick, I'm a consultant based in Horsham, Victoria uh, and I manage the GRDC's Grain Storage Extension Project. Uh, this morning's topic as you can see on your screen is best results for bags and bunkers. Um, some quick housekeeping before we get going. There's a Q&A window which hopefully you can all find which allows you to ask a question. Um, click the Q&A window to open it up your question and then hit send. If you'd like to send a question anonymously, um, just uh, tick where it says uh, send anonymously. Please feel free to ask questions as we go. Um, I'm happy to keep this presentation uh, interactive and answer your questions. I'd also like to thank the Birchard Cropping Group for facilitating this session for us today. If you are having any trouble hearing me or, or connecting, um, please uh, contact the Birchard Cropping Group, Amy, uh, 0456 979 561 and should be able to help you out. Best results for bunker storage. Grain bags, where do they fit into the system, the overall system? Um, often hear people just come to me and they say, oh, grain bags, they're cheap, right? Are they any good? Um, well, to me, yes, they, they do have a place in the system. Um, and yes, they have a low capital cost. They tend to have a bit higher maintenance and a bit higher labour requirement, as you'd expect, the obvious. Um, and and they're, to me, they're really, they're really well suited to the shorter term storage. So if you're thinking about the higher volume, lower value sort of commodities, ideal for those things like harvest logistics. Um, and ideally, you really limit them to dry grain. Um, we don't want to go storing over moisture grain in bags because we we don't have a way to aerate them efficiently. Um, we run the risk of the damage there. With bags, it's really about, um, from the experience I see around the place and the experience people tell me about, um, it's really about the effort you put in. If you don't put much effort in, don't expect a great result. If you put the effort in, um, then you can make them work very well and you can expect to store them for a bit longer. Um, obviously, if you imagine a graph, of time and risk, the longer the bag is down, the higher the risk becomes of something going wrong. That bag degrading, uh, vermin getting in there, pests getting in there, grain quality loss. So, ideally, short term, harvest logistics is a, is a really good spot for them. In those big years where you've got um, a bit high volume of grain that you, you've got to hold, um, but, but not anticipating to hold it for too long. Site selection and preparation um, really is key. Um, you, you see occasionally the, uh, the, the the bag put one bag in the corner of each paddock, um, and unfortunately, they're, they're the typical scenarios where I see people have uh, have issues. Um, one because it's not the best site and it's not managed as well as it could be. So, site selection really is important. So, ideally, we have a central site or even a few central sites around the farm um, that allow us to have all weather access to that site and somewhere that we're going to be driving past regularly. So at least weekly we need to be checking the bags and patching them in holes, dealing with any vermin issues like things like that. So a central site, there are several central sites around the farm where all your bags are stored in the same way that you'd set up your silo. You put them all in a central spot so that they're much easier to monitor and manage and therefore you're more likely to do it with people. Um, obvious ones, high ground, uh, ideally with a slight slope. Um, and you can see in the picture here, we've got a bag which is on a, on a bit of a rise, which is great. Um, the only thing I'd do if I was doing the bag would be to start at the top of the slope and run the bag down the hill. Um, again, just to help with water drain, um, make sure it runs down the hill away from the bag and depending on what sort of seal mechanism you use at the, the end of the bag, um, probably better to have it the other way around with the recommendations that I can use. Um, obviously if you put it across a slope, the water is going to run down the hill and tend to pull against the edge of the bag, which is not really good. So down a bit of a slope is ideal. Compacted surface I've got written there. I've got a nice graded surface in this picture. Um, what I have seen plenty of times is when the rain comes and falls on the bag, runs around the side and pulls the side of the bag a little bit, 
think we could don't have a slope. And that'll soften the ground underneath the bag and then the weight of the bag will actually make it sink into the soil. And so what you end up with the bag, it might be um, a little way under the ground, it actually sinks into the ground. And so if there is a hole under there, if mice do get underneath and push you a hole, um, you end up with a grain bag sitting in a, in a little pool of water. So impacted surface so that the bag sits nice and firm and on top of the ground, the water really runs away. Also stops more pooling at the side here and then the heap of grass growing on the side and leaves on the side. Obvious, free of sticks and sharp rocks, um, goes without saying. Um, people have told me to keep them away from trees where birds nest. Um, obviously birds are a bit of an issue with bags. Um, so having a site that's away from where birds may nest is, is another obvious one, but something that um, I hadn't thought about until someone told me um, another one, um, I've got to give credit to the, to the people that do bags, they've passed on a lot of their tips and tricks of, of what's worked and what hasn't. Um, but away from sand hills on long grass where rabbits and foxes tend to live, um, obviously rabbits are not a huge issue um, for bags, but what chases the rabbits is uh, foxes, and foxes running over the top of the bag um, are a bit of an issue, they can, can run cold. So, keeping them away from those sand hills and long grass where um, they have vermin or shelter. Um, setting up and filling the bag. First step I suppose is to select the quality bag and that can be um, one of the most helpful tips someone gave me was actually just do the thumb test. In the photo here I've got um, a demonstration what I mean by thumb test. Getting a sample of a bag or a corner bag and just trying to stick your thumb through it. Um, to, uh, to, to see how hard or how easy it is to actually punch in a bag. Um, they have improved since they first come to Australia, but the quality of bag for saying now is much better than it started out to be. Um, something to just be aware of, I don't say it much anymore, um, we used to say a little bit, people selling silage bags as grain bags, and they're just not the same, they're not the same quality. So, so keep an eye for that. A bag with a stretch marker on it, also makes life easier. You um, so often come with a ruler, so you just measure up here um, to, to get that ideal amount of stretch that the manufacturer recommends. Things like that to make it easier when you're trying to fill a bag. Um, I don't have any research on this, but people have said they sprinkle a little bit of urea on the ground before laying a bag to deter the mice. Um, again, don't have any, any research around how that works or why that works, but anecdotally, people tell me that it does help. Put that one in, in there as well. S sealing the starting end of a bag is quite important. Um, you, you might have seen or, or might have used the, the, the real easy method of bunching the bag up, putting a cable tie around it, and, and stuffing it underneath itself. It, it really is not the best option um, for, for a few reasons. Um, one of the main ones is when you come to empty the bag, the square of the starting end the less shoveling you have to do. And I don't know, I'm not really enjoying shoveling, so whatever we can do to make that job easier, um, the better. So starting with a nice square end, whether you use this, the, the dedicated seal or a couple of bits of timber, clamp together and then roll it under each other. Um, so roll it under itself. Um, trying to get a, a good seal um, and a square end is, is helpful. Obviously when you're filling, you want to get the correct stretch. I'm um, going to overfill a bag. Um, be aware if you haven't used bags before that they will stretch a, a lot more um, when it's warmer, they'll stretch a lot easier. Um, so be aware of that, 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 that filling a bag on a cool day versus filling a bag on a hot day will be, will be a little bit different. So I think the stretch will be easier so be careful not to overfill them particularly on a hot day. Um, I've got straight there. Some people might think that's a little bit uh, picky and a little bit finicky that we need the bag straight. There's a couple of reasons for that though. Um, one is that it's a lot easier when it comes to outloading if you've got a straight bag to follow. Um, that, that's the first one, an obvious one. The other one is, you've seen the photo here, we've got a couple of creases forming in the bag. Every time the bag changes direction, it will cause a crease. And those creases we find are where mice are most likely to attack because they can chew the bag quite easily. So the straighter we get it, the 
access creases, less spots we've got for, for mice to access. Um, and down here, like I said before, I do again and again. While we look at this photo, you can see the site here. Um, it, it's obviously just in the corner of the paddock. Again, not my, not, not my preference. Uh, I understand it's very convenient for harvest logistics to run it straight from the chaser bin into the bag in the corner of the paddock. Um, but again, it's not ideal and, and really limits the time that I would be comfortable leaving the bag, um, leaving the grain stored in the bag. So if it's just harvest logistics for a month um, and we want to take the risk on being able to outload it when it's dry and not too wet, um, then that might be okay, but just be aware, if you're putting a bag in the corner of the paddock, uh, you don't want to leave it there too long or, or you risk, do start increasing. After filling, obviously we've got to seal up the, the end of the bag where we've, we've finished. Um, again, I, I would go to a bit of effort here. You can get um, proper heat seals just to seal that up properly. Um, to keep the moisture out, it seems like a pretty simple thing, but from what people tell me that the moisture, <laughs> moisture will find its way in there if it's not done properly. So it really is going, worth going the effort. Um, again, clamp the two bits of timber together either, either side of the bag, roll it under itself, and then put some dirt on top of it. Um, hold that end down, that they've opened the end down with some dirt. Obviously, you've got to leave some bag excess there to, to get the unloader started. So some dirt on the top. Uh, we'll stop that flapping around and, and tearing and degrading the bag. Seal that end. Fence off the side, of course. Um, even if we don't have sheep on our farm, there's always a story of the neighbour's sheep got out and ran over the top of my bag, or some wild goats or something, or wild pigs got in it and made a mess. So I, I'd recommend to fence in sight, um, regardless of whether you've got livestock or not, there's always something that a fence will, will deter. Baiting for mice, you can do a pretty simple bait station um, to, to bait the mice um, and cleaning up any spills um, that might have happened around the site. You can see on the left hand side here we've got a beautiful hard compacted site here that makes it really easy to clean up grain spills um, and the reason for that is to to remove a reason for both grain pests and vermin, mice, birds, um, anything like that to be actually attracted to the bag, to be attracted to the site. So. If we clean those spills up and remove them from the site completely, um, we remove the temptation and the attraction for animals to get there. Same as when we're patching the bags, when we're going around monitoring and patching them, that's about stopping that attraction, and stopping them spilling grain out and stopping them from attracting them in. The photo on the right here, we've got a nice um, simple fence around it to stop a vermin. Um, a couple of things I don't like though is they've left the grass grow around the bag, which again is a shelter there for, for mice or, or insects, uh, which is not ideal. And you can see they've got it right beside a, a beautiful fresh tree line, which might be convenient in the core of the paddock, um, but it's it's you know it, it, it's just providing food for those birds that nest in the trees, which is which is not ideal. Regular monitoring I've already touched on. Um, we, we hear weekly is, is the ideal for, for patching bags. Again, depending on where they are and, and how much pressure they are under from vermin. Um, I've had a couple of people tell me they have, have to go around them every couple of days um, to patch them. Again, as soon as you've got a hole, you've got a spot for grain to get out, that becomes an attraction for more vermin. That also is a spot where moisture can get in. So as soon as you've got moisture coming into a bag, you're much more likely to have grain damage, of course, but also provides a really nice spot for insects to start breeding. Warm, moist grain um, is the ideal spot for insects. So it is important to patch those bags nice and quickly. Um, it'd be good to be able to sample the bag, check for moisture, temperature, insect pests. Um, I haven't seen, a, seen a, a, a great system for, for sampling, but I'm sure you guys have got them. Um, whether you use a spear um, and tape around the spear so that it doesn't tear the bag um, and then to, um, to tape the hole up after you spear the sample out. Um, I'm sure you guys will figure out a system to, to, to monitor the grain, but the same way we monitor grain in our, um, in our other silos, we want to monitor grain in bags as well. Uh, obviously if we have big rainfall events, we want to drain the water away. Um, stop the growing weeds around the bag, stop pulling the water and those sorts of things. 
capable of running away and obviously come back and, and add more bait if you need to. And again, I'll put this picture in um, to demonstrate they've got the bag nice and straight, which is making the unloading easy. Um, you can see there's not too many holes. Um, it's likely here that they've um, not put the bag down for too long. So while it's in a paddock um, and, and right beside some trees, they're, they're doing the right thing and not leaving it there too long and expecting to be able to store the grain um, for a great length of time, probably only a month or so in the paddock. A few quick pros and, pros and cons of bags. Um, certainly low capital cost up front. They do allow good segregation, flexible capacity, um, flexible in location. If, if you're leasing ground or you've got a farm that's a distance from the home place and it's, it's not convenient to cart grain home, you could put a um, you know, set up a bag inside there, so flexible in location. The cons, um, or the things to be aware of, they, they will require a bit more labour. Um, it takes two people to, to load a bag. Um, and ideally a couple of people to fill them successfully. You could probably take shortcuts, but again, every shortcut you take really reduces how, how good a job you're going to do and therefore how long you can store the grain successfully in the bag. Uh, at the moment, we, we don't know of a, a, a successful way to aerate the grain in bags, so we limit ourselves to not be able to do aeration cooling. Obviously, there's some risk with, with damage and loss um, with a bag. Um, all the things I'm telling you here is to try and minima, minimise that risk um, and, and limit the storage period. Look, people tell me they've stored in bags really comfortably for up to 12 months, but they're the people that have done everything absolutely ideal as they can. Um, if you're going to take shortcuts or, or perhaps it's, um, it's not an ideal situation, then you know, you're really talking about a three month storage ideally. Um, the longer you store it, the higher the risks. Quick summary on bags there. Um, let's have a quick look at bunkers while we're going on temporary storage. Very similar to bags in the site selection. We want somewhere high, we want good drainage um, to, to keep the moisture away. A compacted pad again for the same reasons as we would do with bags. Um, we don't want the weight of the grain um, forcing a little uh, depression in the soil and then creating a spot for work to pull underneath the, the um, the pad or the bunker. A graded slope. So if you imagine a roadway, we actually want a graded camber across the pad area and then we want to actually slope down so the water runs out of that bunker area as well. So a camber and a slope as well. So it really is worth building um, building a good site for, for a bunker. Um, well, I've heard people say part of their site selection for a bunker if they've got really flat ground is actually where they've got access to some fill um, to do the earthworks um, so they can actually have a bit of dirt in there to, to create the camber of the, the soil without digging into the ground or creating a channel around the outside of the bunker. Um, and bunker walls look doesn't always you don't have to have a, a wall around the bunker it certainly increases your capacity um, and it can help with sealing the tarp down a bit better and holding the tarp, having something to clamp it to. Um, the concrete walls are obviously ideal as a, a good clamping system, but um, there's all sorts of options there for walls. What I wouldn't recommend is using hay or straw as a wall, um, purely because insects, growing pests, um, will live in that hay and straw uh, and infest your, um, infest your, your bunker quite readily. Calculating bunker capacity, there's a few ways to go about it. Um, I'll put this table in here. Um, if people are interested, they can jump on uh, on the website afterwards and, and look it up from the storedgrain.com.au website. Or, uh, or of course, this, this webinar will be recorded so you could possibly pause the webinar and have a look at it. But to give you an idea, start with how high your auger is going to stack the grain. So um, if, if you've got an auger that can reach up four metres, um, expect you'll have about, this is in wheat, um, expect your bunker will be about 17 metres wide given the angle of uh, repose for wheat. Um, if you just did a cone, you'd be looking at about 225 tonne capacity. Um, as an example, if you went 30 metres long, you'd be fitting 570 tonne of wheat um, or 760 cubic metres in that particular size. So, really handy little table there. Um, to figure out the capacity of a bunker. 
the other way to do it, of course, is to calculate it for yourself. Um, you can get your, uh, your angle of repose for, for the various grains here. Um, a grain coefficient, there's a calculation here, um, which you can do, uh, and then add into, uh, add into that. Um, that'll, that'll obviously get you to your volume in, in cubic metres, and then you convert that to um, your conversion factor, whether you're storing wheat or barley or, or whatever you might be putting in the bunker there. To give you an idea of how big a pad you need to grade, how far apart you need to put your bunker walls. Hopefully, um, can help you out. Bunker operation, um, I would always recommend a bottom tarp. Um, I have heard people say that they use the top tarp for a few years and then uh, that becomes a bottom tarp uh, in years to come. So um, you, you can do that, we can get a separate, a, a lighter quality tarp for the, for the bottom. The top tarp, um, there are quite significant differences in the quality of tarp that you can get. So again, if you're looking at bunker for, for more than short term storage, um, go for a, a quality tarp, it really will make a big difference. And having a way to seal it down, this is an ideal method um, to be able to clamp the tarp down to that concrete uh, bunker wall um, is a really nice method there. Um, obviously, if we're going to do a bunker, we'll need a, a method for removing the tarp. Um, depending on the, on the conditions, if there's a bit of breeze, it can be quite dangerous. Um, people have been seriously injured. Um, trying to remove tarps or put tarps on, on bunkers when it's windy. Um, so having a safe way loaders and that sort of stuff that you can um, move the tarps without having to manhandle them really is a good idea. And of course an outloading method, um, it goes without saying whether you use a telehandler or a loader or, or an auger or something like that, but having a method to outload it can obviously help you out. Um, bunker operation, here's a couple of other methods if you put an earth wall, it might be a, a, a temporary sort of bunker, you can put an earth wall there. The ground sheet obviously wants to come up and right over the top of that, that wall and then your, your top tarp will come down and join it. Now I do see, um, I think I've got in the next slide, yes I have, um, people putting a bit of dirt around the bottom of the tarp here to hold the tarp down. Good in theory but it can cause water to pool on top of that little, that little line there. So uh, another method is to actually dig a trench around just outside the bunker um, the tarp to go down and through and then put the soil in into that uh, that little trench so that water running down the, the bunker tarp will run straight across the top and away from the bunker site. Um, again a bit more work, a bit more effort but you, you, you extend the, the likely time that you can store grain there without having an issue. And again these these operational things are very similar to, uh, to bags. Um, we can clean up um, any spills, remove the grain from the site, remove the attraction, um, fence the site off, bait the mice, ensure the tarp is held down so that it doesn't move into the air. Pretty common kind of stuff. Pros and cons of bunkers. Low cost of capital um, up front, flexible capacity, flexible location. Um, obviously it requires a bit more labour. So if labour is something you, you can get at harvest time, then that's fine. If labour is a a real pressure for you at harvest time, then, then, then bags and bunkers may not fit with your system. Um, grain quality, um, questionable is aeration. It is possible in a bunker, um, but it, it is a bit of work and a, and a bit to set up, so I, I don't see it done that commonly, but it is possible. Um, risk of damage and loss, it, again, is there because it's not a permanent storage. Uh, and the work required for successful fumigation um, not impossible, but does require a, a fair bit more work. So we have a look at the big picture of, of managing grain storage um, overall, and, and, and thinking back to that first slide of where the bags and bunkers fit into the grain storage system. We've really got three, three categories that, that I think about in pest prevention. Um, what do we do to try and stop pests getting in? Pest control, what do we do if we do get pests, and how we manage grain quality. So, if we look at those in relation to bags and bunkers, hygiene, and structural treatments in terms of cleaning up around the site, cleaning up any loading or unloading gear, we can do that. We can use our diatomaceous serve, we can clean up there as well, so that's good. Aeration cooling, I'll put a cross against that one. 
Um, while you can do it in bunkers, I don't see it done very commonly because it is so much work just to set up and, and, and manage. Um, so I'll put a cross against that one. Protectants, look, this is where they do have a place in that temporary top storage and, and shorter term. Um, I'll put a question mark there because I don't know of anyone that uh, has actually set up a chaser bin or something to be able to apply protectants um, at the required rate. Um, it, it does seem to be a bit of a challenge to be able to get a, an even consistent flow of grain um, and calibrate that to the protecting application. So certainly it will be possible, I just don't see it that often. So um, yeah, don't put a question mark against that one, but protectants would help of course. And monitoring, absolutely you can do it. I've got a question mark there because so many people I see don't do it um, or they haven't found a way to, to do it conveniently and easily. So they do do it regularly. So, but I know you can, and I know it will pay big, big dividends and benefits to the monitoring. Even if we do all that, we do get pests. What are our options to control them? Um, phosphine is our only control method on farm now. Um, the alternative is, is a commercial fumigator, someone to come and use pro fume and more controlled atmosphere. Um, Look, in bags and bunkers, it is possible, there's research being done um, in both, and it is possible to, to fumigate. Um, it is a bit extra work, there's, there's quite a process to it. One of the real challenges to fumigating in bags is actually venting. Getting the phosphine back out of the bag um, does take a bit of effort. You've actually got to start up a fan and suck the phosphine out, and it will take longer um, to get it out of a, a really long bag than it would for a, a silo. Um, there is more information I'll show you on for that just shortly. Grain quality, again, grain quality is really about moisture and temperature management, which we don't have a lot of options in, in bags and bunkers. So um, it really relies on us putting the grain into those temporary storages at the right conditions so that quality will be maintained um, because we don't have much control over um, maintaining quality in those new type of storages. To sum up, before I get into these, I see a couple of questions coming in, which is fantastic, so keep them coming in. Um, I'd say be prepared to put in the work to get a good result. Um, it'd be unfair to talk to someone about using bags and bunkers and they tell you that they can store it for a long period of time successfully, um, and then you go home and do a, a, do a, uh, a shortcut job or a, a, um, not a good quality as your setup. Um, and then complain that you didn't have the same result. Put the work in, you'll get the, you'll get the better result. Be realistic about your expectations for storage in bags and bunkers. Um, obviously, they do have their limitations, um, but they do have their spots. So um, being able to utilise them, they often work really nicely in conjunction with some permanent storage. So you can, um, you can have a combination of both. If you want to outload a bag or you get an issue and you've got to outload one, to have some permanent storage to outload it into. Um, so you might put a bag in the paddock and then after a month you've got some silo space freed up. You can transfer the grain from the paddock into permanent storage, even if you need to do it if you need to. Um, but having some flexibility really does work quite well. Um, as with my things on the farm, plan ahead. Um, do, do your preparation, figure out your pest control method um, and, and figure out your outloading method and to make sure you can outload in any weather conditions. For more information here, the storedgrain.com.au website, um, or you can, you can contact your nearest grain storage specialist on 100 Leaving. And you can shoot me an email at info at storedgrain.com.au. Some links here, you can click on the links there, successful storage and grain bags as a fact sheet. There's a few um, other information resources there for bags. Um, and bunkers, if you go to the, the website and, and just search bunker, you'll come up with a few resources there. A few videos um, which are, are really quite um, quite handy. Um, one from a grower's perspective, who has been using bags for a while, um, so I encourage you to look at those as well. Got a couple of questions here. I encourage you to, to, um, to keep typing these questions in and I'll, I'll try and tackle them one at a time. Question here, would you fumigate a bag? Um, look, as I said, it is possible. It is a bit more work. 
um, to fumigate in the bag. You, you need to set up a system um, that you can actually put the tablets into the bag uh, about every seven litres uh, so they can liberate um, and then to be able to remove the tablets after the fumigation period. Um, obviously it relies on the bag being sealed completely so the quality of the bag but the, how good a job you've done in actually fixing up any hole with elastic or, or with tape um, will determine how good a result you get. Because we can't do a pressure test on bags or bunkers, um, in an ideal world we'd have gas monitoring equipment to actually tell us whether we're reaching the required two to three hundred parts per million for a seven to ten days. Um, to, to really know that we're getting a good result. Then, as I said, the venting is actually um, one of the tricky parts of, of fumigating in a bag. So it's actually a matter of having a little fan, um, getting some perforated tube with a, a thread on it or like an auger flight. You can actually screw into the, um, the staffing end of the bag, open up the bag, other end of the bag where you're finished filling, um, and actually suck the air through the bag. Um, and suck that fumigant out before we, before we outload. So yes, it's possible. Um, in fact, this, the second link I've got here, storegrain.com.au slash grain bag fumigation, grain bags fumigation. Um, Philip Barrow in that video goes through the process for fumigating in the bag. The, the ideal is, of course, a gas tight suitable storage, um, but, but certainly possible in bags and grain. Other question here, more comment in bags, if you don't leave adequate uh, labour, sorry bags can pose an OHMS risk for operators when loading and unloading bags. Yeah, really good comment, Roy. Um, they do take a bit more labour. Um, you might think you can do it on your own or, or, or um, you know, do it with less people, but certainly agree with your comments there. They are a bit of an OHMS risk. Um, if you try and do too much yourself, certainly much better result to get more people. So if labour is something you're short of at harvest, they may not be your best bet. If you've got plenty of people around, um, then they're obviously going to be a, um, a, a low capital cost um, storage option. Are there any other questions that you guys have got? Um, I've got a few more here that I often get asked, but please feel free to add your questions there if you think of them. One I often hear is uh, that bags are uh, hermetically sealed, therefore um, low oxygen inside so insects can't live. I haven't seen any independent research to back that up, um, so I'm going on hearsay. Um, my, my personal feeling is that it's, uh, if a bag was in perfect condition, it's, it's quite possible. Um, but reality is most bags will have some holes in them at some point uh, to let the oxygen in. So the short answer is I'm, I'm not sure that they are hermetically sealed. I certainly wouldn't want to rely on that as my only insect control. I wouldn't do everything I can to prevent the insects, prevent the burning, prevent the damage. Um, and, and, and hopefully they are sealed that the, the oxygen is low inside, but I certainly wouldn't be relying on that as my only, um, my only method of insect control. Another question here, um, have been problems in the past when used for malt barley, which may be stored uh, for transfer from bags up to 15 months in total from malt and seed to be very, you need to be very careful. Yeah, yeah, that is a uh, good point. Um, malt barley can can be a little more, um, let's say, uh, sensitive to, it, to its storage, certainly in terms of moisture and temperature. Um, we know that the lower the moisture, the lower the temperature, the better the, the quality of malt barley will be maintained. So um, again, keep your bags for your, um, your lower value, higher volume sort of uh, product. Um, and uh, yeah, malt barley, ideally, you put it into uh, a silo that you can have aeration to cool it, cool the grain down quite quickly. Um, so yeah, th thanks for that question or comment. Um, quite, quite a valid one. Are there any other questions or comments?
people have got before we finish up. Um, while you're thinking of them, perhaps I'll just remind you. Uh, our next session will be on the 12th of November at 10 a.m. and we're going to look at grain protectants. So um, the products you can spray on to try and prevent um, insects and the cereal grains. Also, please keep an eye in your email inbox um, for a quick 30 second email. Um, survey just to provide some feedback for us. Uh, as I said, if you'd like more information, storedgrain.com.au website is, is a whole um, gamut of information there. You can email me info at storedgrain.com.au or call 1800 Weeping or put me in touch with your nearest grain storage specialist. Um, there's an app, GLEC Stored Grain app, um, also has some information and monitoring um, capacity capability there um, so feel free to make use of that. Um, the other offer I'll make if, if uh, you would like more information on grain storage and you've got a few people in your region um, we're more than happy uh, to come and look to run a little uh, on-farm training session or workshop at your place um, so, uh, so feel free to contact us if that's something that you think would be helpful. Look, if, there, if there aren't any more questions, I might bring the, the webinar to a close. And thank you very much for your um, your participation and, and for your questions. I appreciate that. Um, and hopefully see you again uh, on the 12th of November.